Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. This is Partnering, Partnering for Healthy Streams, hosted by the Watershed Institute and Land Trust Network. And we also have Erin Stretz from the Watershed Institute and New Jersey Watershed Watch Network, and Carolyn Cobb from Sirelands Conservancy. I hope everyone had a great weekend and a great Mother's Day, and thank you for joining us. My name is Pri, I'm from the Watershed Institute, and for those who for those of you who may not know them, I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. We have Erin Stretz, who is the Assistant Director of Science and Stewardship at the Watershed Institute, where she has specialized in water quality monitoring, assessment, and protection since 2011. Erin has provided opportunities for thousands of volunteers to become engaged in citizen science through programs like the Streamwatch Volunteer Water Quantity Monitoring Program at the Watershed Institute, the Project Search High, uh, high School Monitoring Program from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and as an AmeriCorps New Jersey Watershed Ambassador. Currently, she manages the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network, a statewide service provider for community-based water monitoring programs that is a joint effort between the Watershed Institute and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. We also have Carolyn Klob, who is the Saraland Conservancy Stewardship Program Coordinator. Carolyn has a Bachelor of Science with a concentration in ecology and evolution and a minor in plant science, as well as a Master of Science with a concentration in ecology. She has over 10 years of experience as an ecologist working in diverse ecosystems, such as the Mojave and Sonoran Deserts, the New Jersey Pine Barrens, and urban brownfields such as Liberty State Park. She joined the Sireland Conservancy because she feels passionate about protecting the Sireland Mountain and working with her community to promote ecological stewardship. So thank you, Erin and Carolyn, for presenting this great webinar to the organizations and individuals here today. If anyone has any questions for them throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A and chat features. And if anyone is experiencing any technical issues, which I'm sure there's still some people doing so, I'm here to help. Just let me know in the chat. And all that being said, um, Aries, take it away. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Pri, from the Watershed Institute. And thank you to the Land Trust Network for encouraging Carolyn and I to put together this webinar, um, which would have been an in-person session at the annual Land Conservation Rally uh, back in March. Um, I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy, and I'm glad that you're able to join us virtual or otherwise. Um, so I'm going to start by figuring out, okay, that's good. I'm gonna start by, by just introducing the Watershed Institute in case anyone is unfamiliar. Um, we are a watershed association that uh, is in central New Jersey. Our focus was previously the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed, uh, hence our previous name, the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. Um, we have worked to protect clean water and restore clean water in central New Jersey since 1949. Um, but we changed our name back uh, in 2018 to reflect um, the fact that we were kind of expanding beyond the Millstone watershed. Um, and a lot of our staff were getting into more um, statewide work. One example of that is the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network. Um, so this is something that used to exist back in the year 2000 to 2010. Um, this was basically New Jersey DEP's way of connecting with the community monitoring world. Um, but that kind of went by the wayside over the past few years. And now it's kind of reemerged as a partnership between the Watershed Institute and DEP. So the Watershed Institute manages this network. Um, DEP funds this network, but also has a big role in kind of directing um, where our work takes us with the network. Um, but this comes together to form what we're calling the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network. So I, I know there's a lot of different folks on this call, some who have been monitoring for decades and some who are just kind of dipping their toe into the world of, of monitoring. So 
Um, I figured I would start at the beginning um, to, to let you guys know why DEP cares to have a community monitoring program. And that pretty much started with the Clean Water Act. In 1972, there were two sections of the Clean Water Act that mandated for the first time that all 50 states had to produce a comprehensive review of water quality in their state, something that had never been done before. Um, the point of that is to kind of see where there are impairments, where there are really high quality streams, um, so then we can actually do some work uh, in those areas. So section 305B was that comprehensive review and 303D was specifically a listing of uh, the impaired waters in the state. So a few years ago, uh, they decided to combine those two reports into one document. That's why that's called the integrated report. And so you'll hear me refer to the integrated report quite a few times. Um, but the point of this and the point of the Clean Water Act is really to produce swimmable, drinkable, and fishable waters in New Jersey and across the country. So the logic model of the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network is really to jump in at the ground floor. So we're providing the resources at the base of the pyramid, offering technical assistance, volunteer training, um, different kind of, um, you know, co-op templates and things like that, that will help kind of bolster the work that the community monitors are actually doing. You guys are doing the, the real work, uh, the water quality monitoring. Um, but from there, um, you know, there's a number of outputs, water quality report cards that groups can put together, or the integrated report itself from DEP, which will then lead to these outcomes of stream protections for really high quality waters, or um, the establishment of total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs, for uh, streams that are considered impaired. Um, and again, the idea is to get swimmable, drinkable, and fishable waters. So our objectives, what we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to generate as much high quality community monitoring data for inclusion in the integrated report. Uh, we're trying to make uh, the data that's collected between the different groups consistent. There's a lot of groups that have been out there monitoring for 20, 30 years. Um, and so it's really nice to have everyone kind of get on the same page. And then also we're hoping to collect that comprehensive data across the state, making sure that we're not missing any big spots of the state or missing any big parameters that, that maybe aren't being monitored as much as others. How will we get there? To get high quality data for inclusion in the integrated report, the network is providing individualized technical assistance to groups who need it, who are either looking to start out um, and collect data for the first time, or for those groups that are looking to kind of take it to the next level. Um, I am available uh, to help any group that needs it, obviously. If I don't know the answer, and sometimes, oftentimes I won't, I will then know where to direct you at DEP. Um, and there's a, a large group of folks at DEP that are willing to kind of step into that role and work with community monitoring groups. Uh, the network is also producing standardized materials, uh, so that will help make the data consistent between the different groups. So standardizing QOPs or quality assurance project plans, um, the templates, um, the specific QA measures that would be required for the different data quality tiers, um, and then also uh, we're facilitating the review and approval of those QOPs should you want to, to seek that level of data use with DEP. Uh, we're also looking to standardize data entry and data visualization. And the way that we're doing this is uh, we're working with the River Network and the Water Data Collaborative to create um, an access database that will be, you know, when it's completed, it will be New Jersey specific and will be shared with any group that wants it. And it will provide a way for you to have localized data storage if that's an issue for you, if you have data management. Uh, concerns, that's a way for you to manage that. Um, and it also uh, will produce templates in the comma separated values file, the CSV file, that um, is automatically formatted to be submitted to the water quality exchange. So no more of this, you know, 
for me, when I was running Streamwatch, it was kind of an onerous um, process to turn the data that I had in my access database into the format that the EPA database required. Um, so that will be kind of taking care of that step for you. And it will also be producing spreadsheets that are able to be uploaded into an online data display, um, which you can post on your website, um, share with the world via social media. And what this does is just an automatic um, like charts and graphs and trend lines for the different parameters that you're studying. So that kind of takes a step out of the process as well. I'm really excited about um, getting that started once the apocalypse is over. And then uh, the last thing is getting that comprehensive data across the state. So we've been working for the past year or so trying to beg, borrow, and steal um, your survey responses <laughs> regarding what you're monitoring and where, um, what your interests are as it relates to training opportunities. Um, if you'd like to expand, you know, that kind of thing. And so really doing that inventory has been an important process in trying to figure out just where the monitoring is happening. And then also to identify those data gaps uh, where we can prioritize the establishment of um, additional future monitoring groups. Um, we're also providing a stream school volunteer training. Um, so this is kind of standardizing the way that volunteers can be trained, um, but we're also just doing that for free in areas where, you know, we wanna see more volunteers trained up and joining programs. So what are the benefits of participation? It kind of goes both ways. It's mutualistic here. For community monitors, for example, in the past, there really hasn't been a clearly defined pathway for how your data will be used and accepted by DEP. Uh, but we're hoping to really streamline that process now uh, for community monitors to make it just a, much more simple for people to know how their data is actually being used. And then on, on DEP side, you know, they'd get that additional data for use in the integrated report should community monitors want to take those steps, those additional QA steps, to have their data used in that way. Um, the network also provides kind of a conduit for groups to communicate with each other. Uh, so we had a round table back in January. I thought it was really great. We had part participation presentations from, I think, 15 different organizations. And it's just really nice to get in a room and hear what other community monitoring groups are doing. Um, you know, hear what issues they're going through. It's probably the same kind of stuff that you're going through. And try to learn from each other about how you can approach issues in, in new and different ways. Um, but the benefit on DEP side from that is just having this cohesive kind of network of, of monitoring protocols that makes it easier for them to be able to review and approve co-ops and understand uh, your study design without, you know, having to start from scratch each time. It's kind of, you know, building on the same type of work each time they, they will review a co-op. Uh, the network is also providing training for volunteers and for community uh, monitoring coordinators, workshops, and of course the benefit to DEP is just having a network of highly trained people that they can tap uh, to, to partner with them on monitoring projects as they arise throughout the state. So for example, in a comprehensive regional assessment, um, you know, maybe the, the BFBM is doing additional bacteria monitoring in a specific region and they need a ton of help just to get out there and collect grab samples. Well, this is a way um, for us to identify who's out there, who's, who'd be willing to partner and who you know, would know kind of what they're doing with minimal uh, supervision or training. And then of course, it's just a one-stop shop for community monitoring issues on both sides. So if community monitoring groups have issues they want solved, or if DEP is like, you know, we really want community monitoring groups to be doing this, um, it kind of provides that, that method of communication back and forth. So in that survey that we've been working on for the past year, we've gotten responses from about 49 people. I think it's actually a little bit more, 49 groups rather. Um, of these groups, uh, 31 are actively monitoring. So in the map to the right, those red dots indicate the, um, the monitoring groups that are 
out there doing real scientific monitoring. The orange dots are the groups that are doing monitoring, but at more of like an, an environmental educational level. So there is a, you know, a possibility for them to, to take the next step if, if that's something that they're interested in. And those blue dots, they're not actually community monitoring groups, but they're service providers. So I thought it was important to point them out as well. So for example, uh, Montclair State University up, up in the north part of the state, um, they provide QAP and template assistance, they provide bacteria monitoring, uh, the Interstate Environmental Commission over, that's that blue dot on Staten Island, they will provide free bacteria testing for anyone who is willing to make the trip to Staten Island. Uh, and the Stroud Water Research Center is that blue dot over in Pennsylvania. Um, they currently manage a pretty extensive continuous monitoring network throughout the state. Um, so it's with the help of all of these different groups that we're able to do what we do. And I just want to say, if you are kind of looking in your area of the state and not finding your organization, reach out to me. Visit the, our website, njwatershedwatch.org, and you can find that monitoring inventory survey right on the home page. And I invite you to take that survey if you haven't yet, because we'd love to add your information to this map, of course. So there's a variety of reasons that any number of these organizations started monitoring. And this is kind of in order of uh, the rigorousness of data quality. So environmental education, really all you need are, are some test strips. You pop them in the water, they tell you, you know, they show you a color, pH, you know, and that's something that you can immediately take to kids and, it, and it's like this lasting impact on them. Um, you know, as you move through these boxes, the type of monitoring though has to become a little bit more advanced. So when you get all the way to the integrated report, that's gonna be your most rigorous type of, of monitoring activity. So it's important to, before you start monitoring, really know why you want to monitor, who you want to use your data, because that should then inform the type of monitoring that you're doing. All right, so this is the, the new tier set up. Um, it used to be that DEP had a four tier system, tier A, B, C, and D, uh, with D being at that regulatory level. We've kind of simplified it um, in this way and made it more similar to what a lot of other states are doing as well. Um, so it's a three tier system. Tier one would be that educational level monitoring. Tier two is monitoring that's targeting something specific. It's either a project specific monitoring or it's targeting additional advanced monitoring. And then tier three is that regulatory level, you know, policy making kind of monitoring work. At the tier one level, you know, the, the lowest point of entry here is, is to create a study design. Um, what is a study design? It is, a, it is basically a document where you just sit there and you define what you're doing. And this is so important. A lot of times people will start in this middle box here, the technical design. They'll jump straight to what they're monitoring and where and who's doing it. But, um, you know, as I just mentioned, it's really important to start with your program design before you get to that second step. What is your monitoring reason? Do you have a specific uh, research question that you're trying to answer? Uh, what's your scope geographically and informationally? And the scope is as much of what's included in your monitoring plan as, as what's not included. So it's important to identify that. Um, and then also uh, the data users. You know, basically you need to figure out um, who's using your data so that you can then establish, you know, how, how they should receive that data. So I just uh, saw a question um, in the chat box. Has NJDEP changed to this tier system too? Yes. So the Watershed Watch Network is DEP and the Watershed Institute is just kind of facilitating this kind of work. So this is DEP's tiers. It is currently pending. It just needs to have that final level of review at like the bureau chief and um, division chief level. Um, but this is very likely to just move forward 
as is. Okay. So tier two is our targeting level. The minimum uh, requirement to get into that tier two level is a quality assurance project plan, a QOP. What is a QOP? It's basically taking study design to the next level. Um, it's targeted towards those data users. Since they're the ones using their data, they need to have this document as a way to, to say, okay, is this meeting my data quality objectives? Is this meeting my needs for the, for the type of assessment that I'm doing? Um, so quality assurance measures are those that are implemented beforehand um, to, in an attempt to try to prevent errors as they happen. And errors during sampling definitely, definitely will happen. So one example of a, of a quality assurance or QA measure um, is the um, institution of field audits. Uh, this is a step where you as a program coordinator or me from the network or someone from DEP can come basically with a checklist and watch a volunteer in the field doing what they need to do. And this is just our way of saying, okay, yes, you do know, you know that you need to do this step and this step and this step. And that's just an additional check um, before they actually go out to a sample to make sure that you know, the data is being collected correctly. Quality control measures are those that are implemented after the data is collected. Try to find those errors and correct them. Um, so an example of a, of a quality control or QC measure is duplicate um, identification. So if you have a sample, a macroinvertebrate sample, and you're taking 10 samples in, at 10 different sites in a particular field season, um, this, the standard is really to send 10% of those samples out to another lab to be re-identified, just to make sure that um, whoever is identifying your samples knows what they're doing. So you would send one of those 10 samples after your team IDs them out to just be double checked. So at the tier three regulatory level, um, this is the level you also will need to have a QOP, of course, for this, but the tier three really indicates that that QOP has been approved by DEP, by EPA, or by USGS. Um, there's a variety of different monitoring types that could fall under this category. So for chemical and microbiological monitoring, the requirement is that you're using a certified lab to do that work. Um, if you're doing macroinvertebrate monitoring, um, we have defined uh, basically three different methodologies for your group to collect that data and still be considered tier three. Why is this not moving forward? There we go. So uh, one of the questions that we'll usually get is, you know, should I go with tier two or tier three? Like, what is it? What is the benefit to me? So you know, here I've listed the most common data uses for tier two. And it's like I mentioned, you know, project specific monitoring, which could be monitoring the effectiveness of a stormwater BMP measure, green infrastructure, or a dam removal project, trying to see, how, you know, how and if water quality has rebounded um, after that implementation. Uh, you could be targeting the installation of BMPs. So, where you're finding more impairments could be where you might want to prioritize the installation of green infrastructure. Um, it can also be used to target additional advanced monitoring in the future. So if you're at tier two and you don't necessarily have the ability to take that step to tier three to implement those additional uh, QA, QC measures, you could be at tier two. And that, that is a way to just kind of indicate to DEP, there's a problem here, you need to get out here and, and collect additional data. The tier two data, however, will be used in one of those rotating regional assessments that DEP is performing. So of the five different water regions of the state, they're hitting each one every two years um, where they're kind of, they're, they're not just taking DEP data and the tier three data, they're really looking at all the data that they can find to really put together a more comprehensive review of that particular watershed or water region. And so the tier two data would be included 
in that type of assessment. Um, that said, if there was tier three data that disagreed with tier two data, the tier three data would trump it. So um, as I mentioned, the co-op is required for both tiers, but there are typically additional QA measures that need to be included um, if the data, if the co-op is going to be approved by DEP, because they would then be using it for regulatory assessments, for policy you know, decision-making, um, and it needs to be defensible. So when you collect data, what happens to it? You know, this is kind of the pathway from your mind to the world, right? You identify your problem, you develop your study design, you put together your co-op, you get it approved by DEP. You start your field work, you collect your data. After you collect your data, you can then upload it to the EPA's Water Quality Exchange. Um, and from there, once you upload it to the EPA WQX system, after that, it's automatically able to be viewed on the water quality portal. And this is kind of a one-stop shop for water quality data from EPA, USGS, um, state agencies, municipal agencies, community monitoring groups, academia. Um, it used to be that each of these different you know, entities had their own data display system. But the water quality portal is uh, the National Water Quality Monitoring Council's way of just you know, consolidating all of that data in one place. The minimum barrier to entry for getting your data in WQX and subsequently in the water quality portal is that you need to have a QAP. Uh, the QAP does not necessarily need to be approved by DEP, but you need to have it on file so people potentially using that data can review the QAP. So it, you basically go through, through these steps to get to tier two. If you wanna take that additional step to get to tier three, then your data would be pulled from the water quality portal by um, the NJDEP Bureau of Environmental Analysis, Restoration and Standards, BEARS. Um, they pull that data before they, they do their assessment every two years for the integrated report. Um, they work through all of the data, they, they look at it in comparison with DEP collected data, with other groups' data, and from there they would develop that integrated report. So if you're interested in taking, in kind of moving to that next step, this is what would happen um, to your data at that point. So what do you need at a mo most basic level to start monitoring? If this is something you're interested in doing, um, I highly suggest you work through your study design first, your program design, and then you can get into your technical design. And of course, I'm, I'm here and I'm willing to, to work with you if you want any kind of help or, or uh, you know, assistance with putting that together. Um, at a most basic level, you need volunteers. So that's when, after you put your study design together, you'd start advertising for, for help from your community for people to actually start you know, collecting that data. And from there, you need to develop a training plan. And so I'll kind of explain the training opportunities that the network can provide um, for you, or you can do your own training if you have a, a kind of specific type of monitoring that you're doing. Um, you need to be uh, going out to your monitoring sites. After you establish um, where you're monitoring, you need to check out the sites, make sure they're accessible, uh, make sure you have permission to access the sites, of course. Um, you don't wanna put your volunteers in any kind of um, unsafe conditions. And then you need your monitoring equipment. So your common monitoring types you know, the equipment is gonna base, be based on what you're doing. So the visual and habitat monitoring is the easiest and least expensive uh, type of monitoring that you can start with. You just need eyeballs usually and, and waiters and a clipboard. Um, and there's lots of data sheet templates out there available for your use. Um, the step up from that is macroinvertebrate monitoring. There is extensive training uh, of volunteers that's required up front, but the volunteers tend to really enjoy it. You know, they get to get in the stream, um, get their hands on rocks and, and actually look at these organisms that they find really fascinating. Um, and, it, and it tends to be just a really fulfilling type of volunteer activity for them. For bacterial and chemical monitoring, there's, there's a greater variety in the type of monitoring that you could be doing. So for example, 
uh, in chemical monitoring, you could be using simple, some, something as simple as a test strip, putting it in the water. You could have a handheld meter. You could install a continuous monitoring uh, sensor at a particular location to get data every five minutes. Uh, you could take grab samples and take them out to a lab. Uh, the chemical monitoring tends to be the most expensive type of monitoring uh, when you really want to get to that tier two and tier three level. Um, with the bacterial monitoring, there's tons of partnerships available. There are people out there that are willing to uh, run your samples for free as long as you're willing to transport them. So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely some options there if that's something that you're interested in. But I'd like to make the case that starting with macroinvertebrate and habitat assessments is kind of like the lowest hanging fruit. So if you're interested in getting involved in a new monitoring program, this is a great place to start. There's a relatively um, low cost associated with starting a macroinvertebrate monitoring. There's a range of options within the, that tier three regulatory monitoring level. Crop templates, there's one-on-one -on -one assistance, there's volunteer training um, that's available. So this, this is definitely like the easiest thing that you could do. Uh, I just wanted to mention though, that in regards to the chemical monitoring, we are currently working with uh, the Office of Quality Assurance to try to streamline that process. Um, as it stands now, the fees for, for lab certification, if your group wanted to seek that, that level of certification, um, it's about $1,300 for the first year and about $900 for every subsequent year after that to maintain your certification. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's a barrier for a, a lot of groups. So, you know, we're doing what we can. No promises. <laughs> can be made at this point, but we're really working toward making this just an easier process. And uh, that will start with just a document that explains step by step what you need to do. Like step one, fill out this form. Step two, email it to this person. Just so, so the, the process doesn't seem so daunting for a lot of groups. And here, so we will uh, be sharing this uh, presentation with you guys. This is a wordy slide. Also, this document is available on njwatershedwatch.org. Um, and this is a review of the three different macroinvertebrate sampling methods that uh, you could use at that tier three level. They range from good to better to best. Good is uh, basically an AmeriCorps uh, sampling method. You are collecting and IDing your organism stream side and returning them uh, back to the stream. Then on the other side, on the best side, um, you're preserving your sample in ethanol and you're sending it out to a lab uh, for identification to the lowest taxonomic level. Of course, there's different time commitments. Uh, there's different costs associated um, with these various uh, methods. And the most costly would probably be that uh, method 3.3, about 150 to $250 per sample for a lab to identify your sample down to, um, to genus level. But it's the least uh, intensive kind of work for volunteers. The training is about a day. Uh, it's about a one to two hours in the field for volunteers. Uh, compare that to that middle range, the better uh, method, 3.2, where volunteers, you are still collecting samples, you're preserving them, but the volunteers themselves are doing the identification down to the family taxonomic level. So there's a lot more training involved there. Um, there's a lot more uh, time associated with collecting that, that uh, sample and then processing it and IDing it. Um, and then, you know, method 3.1, you go out in the field and you're done, but there's a lot of training associated with that. So, you know, it's something to take into account based on the type of data that you're trying to collect and the resources that you have available to your program. There are QA requirements, and this is a relatively new um, uh, kind of addition to the co-ops that we're now processing for community monitoring macroinvertebrate programs. And Carolyn is going to talk about her experience with this 
because it does seem a little bit daunting at first to require that all of your volunteers take an in-person 50 organism test and pass it with 90% or greater. Uh, that's that's a really high pass, uh, you know, a really high percentage that you need to, to get correct. Um, so, you know, what is the network's role in this? We're providing stream schools. Um, we're providing online quizzes for volunteers to just kind of refresh their their memory, um, their abilities uh, to identify. Um, and then field audits, this is something else that's being introduced. Um, the network will offer train the trainer uh, assistance, meaning, um, you know, I, I can show you the kind of checklists that we use to do the field audits, which will then enable you to do field audits for your own volunteers. Um, for new clops coming in, this will be a requirement um, so that you as a coordinator would need to administer these field audits for each volunteer before their first sample is actually accepted. Um, so stream school, uh, we would have held it last weekend uh, with the Rahway River Watershed Association, uh, but we've pushed it forward to September 26th and 27th. Hopefully that date sticks. Uh, but this stream school training is at the tier 3.1 level. Uh, we're getting Rahway River Watershed Association up and running with a new program there. Basically what this entails, it's a two-day intensive session where we introduce macroinvertebrate sampling protocols. Uh, macroinvertebrate identification to the order slash family taxonomic level. Uh, we introduced the, the EPA rapid bioassessment protocol uh, for your, your habitat and visual assessments. And then at the end of that, we can provide that test. Um, for Rahway and, and for Sauerland Conservancy and for any group, you know, really, I would suggest waiting to hold that test until uh, maybe a few weeks after this training to give your volunteers more of a chance to just kind of get more familiar with, with your, their identifications before they take that next step. Um, what we've done with Sauerland Conservancy is combined that um, the ID test with the field audits and Carolyn will go into, um, you know, what that looks like, what that looked like for her organization. So typically the stream schools are open only to volunteers uh, who are interested in joining up with the program, but I'd like to extend the invitation to any program coordinators uh, who are interested in kind of learning about monitoring and how to get started. Um, we do have a registration link up on njwatershedwatch.org on the homepage, so you can scroll down and register for this uh, session. You know, it might be a nice way to spend a September weekend if we are allowed outside. And then I wanted to mention this uh, just before uh, I finish and let Carolyn come up. Um, this is a brand new way that DEP is uh, working with community monitoring groups. And this is in relation to harmful algal blooms or HAB monitoring. So DEP is launching a new uh, platform in the, in the coming weeks, probably early June. Um, in which they will have an improved way that they display HAB monitoring data and where blooms are occurring throughout the state. But they're also improving the way that uh, community monitoring groups or citizen scientists would share um, information about suspected blooms with DEP. You know, it has to be kind of a quick turnaround. You see something, you have to share it with DEP and they have to be able to respond pretty quickly. So, in conjunction with that, the Watershed Watch Network is also launching a new visual lakes monitoring system. Uh, it'll be an online uh, data sharing or, or data submission tool using Survey123 that's linked with an ARC Online account. Um, I don't believe you have to have an ARC Online account to participate, um, but this will be, uh, we'll go over this in a virtual training in mid-June. Uh, where we'll have uh, someone from DEP introducing their new platform, and then we will also introduce this lakes monitoring um, system. So um, I hope that you can join us. There's a survey that we just sent out uh, through our list serve, but it's also 
up on our website. So again, you know, where to go from here. If you want to learn more, get more involved in monitoring, visit njwatershedwatch.org. On that homepage, you'll find uh, the link to the monitoring inventory survey, uh, the link to that survey about our HAB monitoring program. Basically ask questions about um, what type of monitoring you'd be willing to do, what kind of time commitment um, that you can offer, and then, you know, if you'd like to attend the workshop in mid-June. Um, there's also a way for you to share your monitoring site information with us, so your actual locations and the kind of monitoring going on there. That Stream School registration is also on that homepage. And then I also wanted to mention, uh, you should keep an eye out for the 2020 2021 Watershed Institute Small Grants Program RFP, um, which should be released, I believe, in June. Uh, PRE would be the contact for that. Um, and so, you know, if you want to get a monitoring program started, this is a great way to, to provide a little bit of startup money uh, to get that going. And then, of course, just contact me if you have any questions about your program getting started. I would love to help. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Carolyn to talk about her experiences at the Sourland Conservancy. All right. Thank you, Erin, and thank you, Pre. Um, let me get this up. Hmm. Okie dokie. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, you're good. All right. So thank you so much, Erin and Pre, for um, all your help getting this going. I really appreciate it. My name is Carolyn Clauba. I'm the Sourland Stewardship Program Coordinator, um, and I work for the Sourland Conservancy. And I know that the things that Erin were talking about seemed really intimidating, but you definitely can do it. We are a really small nonprofit. Um, there's one full-time staff member and three part-time staff. Um, and we're doing uh, the program that Aaron talked about, we're going for our tier 3.1 certification. So uh, for those of you are, that are not familiar with the Sourlands and where we are, we're in that dark blue spot right um, in central New Jersey. The Sourland Mountain region is a 90 square mile contiguous forest in central New Jersey. It's in Hunterdon County, Somerset County, and Mercer County. And the Sourland Conservancy's mission is to promote, protect, and preserve the Sourland Mountain region. We do this through education, advocacy, and stewardship. And so we really love partnering with different organizations, and we are very interested in engaging our local community in environmental stewardship. And so, um, this program got started because there was a need. There was a lot of um, a lot of people that were really concerned about the water in the region, and there was not a lot of monitoring going on. So that was the need. And then people were really excited about participating in this program. Um, so we wanted to connect these two points together. So we applied for a uh, watershed grant small small grants program, the one that Erin had just mentioned, and we received it, and that's how we got this program started. Um, and so we partnered in this program. We partnered with the Watershed Institute, um, NJDEP, and the New Jersey Watershed Ambassadors. So our first year, we had one of the Watershed Ambassadors, um, Fairfax Hutter, she was the Watershed Ambassador that came out, and she did one stream monitoring uh, training with us. So it was an indoor session and an outdoor session. So the indoor session was a presentation just talking about the importance of stream monitoring, why you want to do it. And then the outdoor session was just some hands on experience. And we um, did this at Rosedale Park and, and the Hunt House. Um, and we partnered with Mercer County Park Commission for this first round. And people were just really excited about it. They didn't want it just to end at that one session. Um, and so we partnered volunteers up with Fairfax to go out and apprentice with them. 
with her. Um, and again, people were just really excited about it. They really liked it and they wanted more. So we thought about what can we do to make this program better? What, what are the steps that we can take to get these really motivated volunteers out in the stream and collecting data? Um, and so people just didn't want to have this one off. They didn't want to have their information, the data they, they're collecting just kind of blow to the wind. They didn't want it just to be um, for them. They wanted it to be able to be used. And so we uh, talked with the Watershed Institute, so mainly Erin and uh, NJDEP, and we kind of came up with what would it mean to have the data collected by these volunteers be usable by the NJDEP. Um, because while the environmental education aspect was really great and some volunteers just wanted to stop there, they just wanted to get out, get their hands dirty, see what a macro looked like, what does a mayfly look like, or a stonefly, um, or helgramite, which was really fun for a lot of people. But then there were some people that really want to go that next level um, because they're really passionate about protecting our streams. Um, and so we got um, Erin from the Watershed Institute. We had um, Debbie Kratzer and a few other people from NGDEP. We had Fairfax with us and the Sutherland Conservancy staff. And we all got together in a room and started kind of trying to piece out and throw ideas together about what would it look like to create a program to have these volunteers be trained to the level that DEP would accept their data. Um, and so we kind of fleshed out a plan that we thought would work where it'd be a two-tiered training system. So the first training would be by uh, the Sutherland Mountain region uh, watershed ambassadors. So there's three different watershed ambassadors that work in the Sutherland Mountain region and um, WMA 8, 10, and I believe 11 are the three um, watershed regions. And so the first part of that training session would be done by watershed ambassadors. So they would do what we call a little taster. And that's our uh, two-part stream monitoring workshop where it was on the first part would be on a weeknight. Usually we do Thursday night for two hours where volunteers would come to the local library or we sometimes had it at the Watershed Institute or at the Hunt House. And they would come for two hours and just sit together and have a presentation led by the Watershed Ambassador about stream health and, and you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of why we do it, how we do it. And then the second session is a two hour outdoor session um, where they get in the stream and get their hands dirty. And so, you know, volunteers that really were interested in that and they wanted to keep going, we did the apprenticeship with the watershed ambassador. So we matched them up and then um, had them do one or two sessions with the watershed ambassador before we put them out to stream school. And so, you know, during this whole planning process, we realized, okay, if we want to get this data to NJDEP into that integrated report, we need to have a co-op. Um, and that was, you know, for me, at least very, very intimidating. Um, I went to the NJDEP Division of Water Monitoring Standards, the Bureau of Environmental Analysis, Restoration and Standards, which is BEARS, um, and they have a whole list of how to write a co-op um, and guidelines of how to do it. And um, I looked at the New Jersey Watershed Ambassadors co-op and kind of thought that this is too hard. I can't do it. Um, but I met with Erin, we sat down, we kind of broke it down of what are the different things that I really need to have in this co-op and um, breaking it down piece by piece to be able to write it. So uh, I use the New Jersey Watershed Ambassadors as a basic template of what 
we were going to do and then built it out from there. So I didn't start from scratch. We we're following the same collecting protocols as New Jersey watershed ambassadors are. So that made it a lot easier. Um, and we are doing macro invertebrate sampling and habitat assessment. So I use their QWAP as the outline and then I fine tuned it to what was specific to our region. Um, and then choosing the locations and obtaining permission for our water sampling. So at the Sourland Conservancy, we don't actually own land, um, but we partner with a lot of other organizations and municipalities to do different types of restoration work. And so, again, I sat with Erin and I talked about, you know, what the goals were for our organization um, and the things that were important to us. And we went forward from there to choose the locations. Um, and I went out and I ground truth the locations because we looked around on the map and, and chose sites that we thought were good. And then I drove there to make sure it was not only um, accessible, but it was a safe place to send volunteers because I didn't feel comfortable sending volunteers someplace where they couldn't park safely or they couldn't access the stream in a safe manner. Um, and so for us, it was really important that, you know, we not only get good data, but we provide a good experience for our volunteers. So simultaneously, while I'm working on the QWAP, we're getting our stream school going. Um, and our stream school was for participants and volunteers that had already went to our spring taster session. So we already knew that they had at least a basic level of knowledge when it came to stream health and how to collect macro invertebrates and how to do habitat assessment, um, but also that they were interested because stream school is a really big commitment for them as a volunteer and for us as an organization. And so we wanted to make sure that before we sent them there we and had them give up their entire weekend and before we invested um, our resources into them, we want to make sure that that was a really good matchup. And we had about a 50 to 60% retention rate from our spring stream monitoring training, the, those taster sessions. So people, about 60% of the people that went to those came to stream school. Um, and it was a really intensive weekend. And we started around, leave nine o'clock in the morning and we go into about five o'clock um so it was really intensive we were there all day together um but it was i think it was a really great experience because everybody that was there kind of knew what they were getting into um and the difference between the spring taster and our stream school is that the stream school was uh taught by aaron and it was taught by debbie krauser from NJDEP. Um, I did a little bit of um, presenting there as well, but I primarily talked about the specific region of New Jersey that we're in and what's unique about this area. But primarily it was taught by two professionals in the field. And the New Jersey watershed ambassadors did a really great job in their spring tasters. Um, but there was not really, consistency between each of the different watershed ambassadors. They each had their own teaching style and the things that they were really interested in. And so, you know, they covered material a little bit differently. Um, some spent a lot of time on the habitat assessment and really were very vigorous and rigorous, <laughs> excuse me, in um, how they cover that. And other ones weren't. You know, they barely touched upon that, even when we're doing the hands-on they were really invested in people knowing their macros. So the experiences of the participants were slightly different because they were different teachers and they were covering different things. Even though it was generally the same topic, um, the level of detail between the different teachers was very different. So um, I really like the consistency of stream school and how we covered everything really in depth. Um, so for stream school, we follow the same format and content that the watershed ambassadors are trained by. Um, 
and it we really wanted to work on making a very um, collaborative and friendly environment um, to get participants really comfortable and wanting to talk and ask questions um, because at least from my point of view it's really dangerous to have people feel like they can't ask questions or overly confident in what they're doing because then they're going to make assumptions and make mistakes and mistakes happen and mistakes are okay but um if we are going to send these volunteers out to collect really uh useful data that can be used by NJDP. We need to make sure that they truly, truly understand what they're doing. So we want to create an environment that they feel like they can ask questions. They can say, hey, you know, what about this or what about that? And, and really going back and forth um, with the instructors and um, having everybody feel good about this. So um, Another thing we did is we really fed our uh, participants. We gave them a really nice breakfast and a really nice um, spread in the afternoon. They were on their own for lunch. But I feel like because we were creating a really welcoming environment, we were creating an environment for them to ask questions and feel relaxed. Um, it really helped everybody get really engaged. Um, and so these are some pictures from our uh, stream school volunteers were super interested in getting their hands dirty, getting in the stream. Um, we were blessed with really nice weather to be able to do um, our stream school. And again, we had people outdoors, we had some indoors, everybody working really um, collaboratively and asking questions, which was just really awesome. Um, everybody seemed to be having a really nice time. And that for me is something that's really important when, you know, we're having our volunteers go out and collect information and um, learn something that I want it to be a really positive environment for them. Um, and so over the winter, we did, um, oops, we did monthly quizzes um, for our stream monitors. We wanted them to keep their skills sharp and to practice. Um, so Aaron had sent me these quizzes that I forwarded onto our volunteers and kind of just checked in with them, said, hey, you know, I've seen that you haven't done your quiz. Is anything going on? Do you not want to participate? And kind of just a really open back and forth conversation and, and free flow of information between um, the Sarahland Conservancy and our volunteers. And I also provided incentives saying, you know, if you do all of your quizzes, I will give you a hat or a shirt or anything like that, just to make sure that we kept that uh, flow back and forth between our volunteers and us and that everybody had really good and positive feelings about what they were doing. Um, and then for this year, we were going to collaborate even with even more organizations. Um, like I said before, the Sutherland Conservancy loves to partner. Um, and so we were partnering with Lambertville Goes Wild to um, do a stream monitoring workshop in Lambertville, the Hundred and Land Trust to do one over there with them, um, partnering with DNR Greenway and Hillsborough Township to collect samples on their property. So, you know, we just kind of spread out to all the other organizations that we, we work with on maybe different projects and said, hey, you know, do you want to do stream monitoring with us? Will you help us, you know, find a location to do samples in or do you want to host one of our workshops um, in collaboration with, you know, the Watershed Institute and the Watershed Ambassadors and NDEP, do you want to be part of this? And so we really made sure that we walked around with open hands and open arms saying, this is a really great program. It seems really intimidating at first, but you can do it and we want to do it with you. Um, and so we had our stream school, uh, um, booked for April 4th 
uh, that's when we were supposed to have it. We were going to have a lab practical and a field practical where Aaron was going to come out and and watch our stream monitors do their field practical, see how they collected the data, whether they're doing the stream habitat assessment or collecting macros, and then our lab practical, we're going to go and have our 50 bug quiz um, where participants would do their um, identification of the macros. And then we're going to have a celebration. Uh, just order a bunch of food and have everybody hang out and just relax and thank them for all the time that they've given up and spent and, and dedicated to this program, we really wanted to celebrate them because without our volunteers, we can't do the work that we do. Um, and I think that that was something that was really important to our organization is just making sure that everybody feels good about what they're doing, not just that um, they're doing good work being a stream monitor and collecting valuable data, but also that they're appreciated and they are. Um, so that was something that was really important to us. And then after uh, stream school, Aaron and I were going to go through all of the lab practicals and field practicals and grade them. And then volunteers could be certified if they had passed the requirements, such as 90% uh, or better on their macro quiz or macro test. Um, and they passed their field audit. Um, and so volunteers would hold this certification for one year, which would allow them to collect the tier three data. Um, some volunteers were a little concerned of whether or not they were gonna be able to pass the 90% macro quiz. And, you know, their concerns were, you know, I, they would feel embarrassed that they did not pass and somebody would know other than us. And, uh, I reassured them that nobody knows whether you got the 90 or not other than Aaron, myself, and you. Um, and that we would be pairing volunteers up um, anyways because we wouldn't want them going out alone just for safety reasons. Um, and so it's up to them whether they wanted to disclose that they passed or not. Um, I think I can understand where somebody would feel uncomfortable um, with that information that if somebody would think that they, you know, weren't a good student. But honestly, our volunteers were so great. They were so knowledgeable um, and they were really dedicated to practicing their identification. And I really have full confidence in all of them that they were gonna do great. But, you know, when volunteers would come to me with concerns of, you know, I don't think that I can do this or, or you know, how can I do this? You know, really stopping and taking the time to talk, talk it through with them. Um, and overall, I think most of everybody's worries were, were quelled with, you know, open conversation back and forth. So um, because of COVID-19, all of our events have been postponed. So we didn't get to do our stream graduate, our stream school graduation. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out what's the best way to move forward. Um, we've talked about virtual workshops, field work, um, if volunteers could go out and just do some sampling on their own. Uh, you know, Erin and I haven't really been able to come up with a really great solution for this because the um, stream school uh, graduation, it really needs to be in person. We really need to see people being able to identify those organisms um, in situ. You know, it's different to be able to look at a picture of a macro and it's blown up really big and you can see all the little details versus being there in person and trying to see and identify it um, with, a, with a hand lens. And also, you, you know, I can't assess somebody's ability to collect data um, if I'm not there. So there's a lot of question marks right now. We're trying to figure out, you know, how we're gonna move forward. Um, so I'm definitely open to any suggestions anybody has about, you know, maybe what their organization is doing in light of COVID-19 as far as stream monitoring or stewardship goes. Um, you know, we've really just put a pause on everything because we want to make sure that everything that we're going to do is safe. You know, it's safe to go out and collect the data 
It's, you know, it's safe to be around people because this is not something that you can do by yourself. God forbid you fell into the stream or twisted your ankle. There really needs to be at least two people there. Um, so, you know, that's been an open conversation about what we're going to do and how we're going to move forward. But, um, yeah, right now everything's kind of on hold, but it's a great time to do your co-op. Erin and I have our a meeting next week um, to finalize the one that the Sarland Conservancy has and submit it. So even though you can't go out and do field work right now, it's a great time to plan, um, talk to people, reach out through um, your newsletters, if you have newsletters and social media, um, and just, see if anybody's interested and start that ball rolling because we can't go out in groups doesn't mean that we can't do anything. So I wanted to say thank you so much to the Watershed Institute and NJDEP, um, the Watershed, New Jersey Watershed Ambassadors, they've been awesome. Um, Mercer County Park Commission has been so helpful in letting us use the Hunt House when we're doing our stream monitoring training. Um, the Sutherland Conservancy Stream Volunteers, they are Phenomenal. So, Conservancy. No one hurt his head. Okay, honey. Sorry. So, Lincoln Conservancy members and volunteers, and please um, make sure to check out <laughs> our website at sourland.org. That's amazing. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, thank you, Carolyn. That's, that's, it's really nice to see, um, the, the work that we kind of require of groups humanized in that kind of way. You know, it is doable. We want people to do it. We don't want to scare anyone away. Um, we want to partner with you guys. So thank you for explaining that. And, uh, I hope we can get together at some point soon to get that yeah. graduation done. Um, I think, I think we have a few minutes for questions. I don't know pre um, what the end time is, but if anyone has questions, you could type it into the box, um, either the Q&A box or the chat box, and we can get back to you either here or um, after the fact. Okay, so I mentioned this in the chat. Um, there are people on in this webinar now um, who are in the process of putting new programs together. So Sarah Helbel from the New Jersey Division of Military and Veterans Affairs is interested in putting together a tier 3.3 program. Uh, Rahway River Watershed Association, of course, is interested in putting together their tier 3.1 program in advance of their stream school in September. Um, so a lot of these, this tier information was finalized in like the last week. <laughs> uh, so we had a, a meeting on April 30th with DEP, with people from a variety of different bureaus uh, sharing their thoughts, their opinions on, on what they would wanna see from community monitoring data. Um, that's where those tier, uh, that tier document came from. And that's why it's still pending because it does need to make its way up the DEP food chain. Um, but I am taking that information at this point and creating template co-ops for each tier. So Sarah, I got you. You're a tier 3.3 co-op is coming your way. And Carolyn's co-op, the tier 3.1 co-op, it's actually gonna be the template. You know, we'll remove some Sourland Conservancy specific information and that will be the template for other groups to take and use. So, you know, we're going through this, this process of developing these materials, but they will be um, made available to those that come after. There's another question in the box here. Uh, the question is, Erin, you mentioned entities that will analyze bacterial samples for free. I heard you specifically call out the Staten Island location, but I'm interested in where else these services are offered. I am in PA. Bartram's Garden, nice to see you here, uh, part of the AWE network. Um, in PA, 
I am not sure if there are um, any entities that are providing those kinds of services. Um, it could be, and I don't know this for sure, it could be that the Academy of Natural Sciences um, could be providing some of those services through the, the um, DRWI clusters. I'm not really sure about Pennsylvania. But in, in New Jersey, and, and especially in, in North Jersey, the Interstate Environmental Commission is definitely there. They, they want your samples. They want to be able to provide these services for free. Um, but a lot of people just aren't taking advantage of them because there are hold times when you collect bacteria samples. Um, you collect a sample, you have to get it to the lab, sometimes within six hours of collection. Um, the, the actual hold time is eight hours, but labs like a, a, you know some wiggle room so they can actually process the samples. Um, there are also uh, DEP labs, specifically the Bureau of uh, Marine Water Monitoring. They have a lab down in Leeds Point in South Jersey, and there are situations in which they would partner with community groups to provide that free bacteria testing um, whether it's just straight enumeration of E. coli or Enterococcus uh, or fecal coliform, but they also would do, um, you know, the identification of, of the origination of the bacteria. So if it's from, totally the word escaped me, um, if it's from livestock or, um, you know, waterfowl or human or dog, you know, that kind of thing. So it, you can better like trace where the bacteria is coming from. I hope that answered that question. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, Pri, um, I think we can call it. So I will. Uh, we've recorded this presentation. Um, we will send it out to all attendees and those that weren't able to make it. I'll also post it on the njwatershedwatch.org website. And thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Pri, when is your RFP coming out for the small grants program? Thank you, Erin and Carolyn. <laughs> what you know i'm not <laughs> i'm i'm not i'm not exactly sure um okay. i need to meet with mike to talk about the details for it but it should be coming out soon hopefully great yeah people need funding to do monitoring yeah, work and that's you guys, definitely a great help yeah you guys have a great day all right guys carolyn right. free and everyone yeah, else is, i mean i can't what'd you say my internet. Oh, I just wanted to again thank you guys. Thank you, Erin, and, and uh, for all of your help. Both of you are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're awesome. You're the one actually doing the work. We're just encouraging you to do it. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, it's sure. been a pleasure. <laughs> Have a great one. I all hope right. to hear from many Thank of you, you soon all and right. see you in person. Hit that, hit that link.